We are in Derech Hashem, and it is on page 524, and it says the Ramchal explains the outcome of the proper recital of the first verse of Shema. All of these concepts have a great impact on the rectification of the entire creation, and he explains testifying about Hashem's oneness as described in section 1, and acknowledging His sovereignty. Again, they have a great impact. If, for example, if we acknowledge Hashem's sovereignty and accept it over us, he will act toward us as a king. A king provides for his subjects. So the Ramchal begins with the impact of acknowledging Hashem as king. This is so because the systems of creation and its mechanisms are arranged in a way that when Hashem's sovereignty is known, all of his created beings acknowledge his reign. And he says in Da'at Tavunat, the Ramchal uses the language of the mechanism of a clock with gears to describe how man's actions affect the entire creation. Thus, in addition to the various systems of Hashem's creation, there are also mechanisms connecting one to another and all of them to man. Uh, okay, so, and then he says in 94, when not, only, when not only the few will acknowledge Hashem as king, but rather the entire world will acknowledge his reign, we, as we pray, on the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in the Amida, that's what we're talking about. So all, then, all goodness and tranquility are found among the created beings. Blessings multiplies within their midst, and their well-being is enhanced. So he explains in part two, the Ramchal wrote <coughs> that when uh, people are devoted to the pursuit of wisdom and engage in the service of their creator, tranquility and quiet will spread throughout the world. Here the Ramchal teaches us that the underlying cause of that good manifesting itself in the world is recognition of Hashem's sovereignty. So he continues, and he says, but when the servants break loose and do not subjugate themselves nor acknowledge Hashem's sovereignty, there is an absence of all goodness. Darkness prevails and evil rules. In con he says, in contrast to m blessings multiply and well-being is enhanced, darkness will manifest itself instead of blessing and evil in a place of well-being. The matters, these matters of the ways of Hashem emanate downward through all the divisions of creation, through the upper beings and the lower ones among them, among those who act and who are acted upon, as we have mentioned in part one. How are you? Okay. We're on page 526. Well, so he says, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so the word ha'elyonim can refer both to the physical realm and the spiritual. All the forces that act upon the physical world, which include the heavenly bodies, and shamot, that influence the body, and transcendent beings and the physical world, which is acted upon by those forces. Thus, the effects of acknowledgement of Hashem's sovereignty or the lack of that acknowledgement reverberate through the entire creation from the highest spiritual realms to our physical world. And if you go to chapter 5, you'll see the Ramchal explained how all physical matter originated as a spiritual force in the upper realms. So you basically have a ladder here, if you remember the whole situation. It start, the chain reaction starts from Hashem, it comes all the way down through different kohot and a different shef, uh, shef, uh, shef, uh, shefa that, he, that is coming down to this earth. So if we're causing uh, <clears throat> good, so that's the shefa is going to be brought down that way. If we're causing, if we're doing, breaking the rules, it's going to push it away. This is a chain reaction. I mean, it, it takes... It could take it could take uh, micro uh, nanoseconds. I don't know, but it seems to take a little bit of a time. In, in comparison, what was, <laughs> it's not a great, it's not a great comparison, but I'll give it Reaganomics. When Reagan got into office and started, whether or not it worked, I don't know. But Reaganomics, when everybody's yelling at, today, it worked. So, Re but Reaganomics didn't start didn't work right away. As a matter of fact. In his first two years of office, I think, they were yelling and wanted to kick him out because they thought it was the worst thing that ever happened. And then it kicked in, fine. The one who they claim got, uh, 
got rewarded for it was Clinton, though, because Clinton had a great economy under him, and they said that was a result of Reaganomics, trickle down economics, I think they called it, right? So the uh, but that's the point. Sometimes it takes a little while for the, for the for that to happen. So we see it as well. We did something good, so good should automatically follow. We did something bad, punishment should should automatically follow. It doesn't work like that. There are things, apparently, according to what he's saying, if I'm understanding him properly, so he's saying it's, it's, change, it's coming down or up, whatever the system's going to be, and it takes a little, as it were, time to get the job done. Again, that's how I'm understanding it. Whether or not Hashem's sovereignty is known certainly depends upon the actions of the lower beings. And he says, although even Malachim can acknowledge that Hashem is king, only the actions of people can lead to greater or lesser revelation of Hashem's servant, sovereignty within the world. And again, that's if I'm following the commandments, so then that brings a revelation all the most into the world. If I'm not following the commandments, I'm, I'm breaking them, I'm doing whatever I want with them, I'm ignoring them, then that's going to lessen the revelation of Hashem in this world. Because the only reason, and that this is important, uh, as I've said it many times, the only reason that we do mitzvot is because Hashem commanded us to do it. If we do the mitzvot because it makes sense to us, then it's not a good reason. It doesn't do anything. Because once they stop making sense to us, we stop doing it. So we have to accept that, that authority over us. And again, whether or not it makes sense, you do it. So that brings the revelation of God into being. Because when a person asks me why I'm kosher, I don't give fancy reasons. I say because it's in the Torah. Why do I, why do I keep Pesach? Because Hashem said so. Period. I, if I could prove to you, somebody once said to me, I could prove to you that the Canaanites had a, uh, I think the Canaanites had a festival like this. I said, what do I care? It's in the Torah. <laughs> it's irrelevant to me. I'm not doing it because it, my father did it. I'm doing it because the Torah says to do it. That's why when it comes to Father's Day even though we celebrated Father's Day, I don't, if my kids give me a card or say Happy Father's Day, thank you. If not, I don't lose any sleep over it. Okay, it comes to July 4th. We used to have a barbecue. I don't have a barbecue. I'm a bad American, I can tell you. I don't shoot the firecrackers off. I don't do a lot of things that are minhug America. Okay, because it's not written down in the Torah. I don't have to do it. <laughs> One of the past years, it was too dry. Okay, okay. Uh, again, so they break the laws when they, they break their own minhag. <laughs> the point is that it, because it, when it's a minhag of the, uh, like, a, uh, you know, but when it goes into the uh, things that we don't have to do, so what? I don't watch Super Bowl. <gasps> I'm, a bad, I'm a bad American. I don't watch Super Bowl. I don't even know who's in the Super Bowl to play. I don't know when Super Bowl is unless it's a Cheerios, Super Bowl weekend. Cheerios. What? Cheerios and Please don't, don't. Okay, but it's uh, don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> but again, you know that that's what I'm saying. We don't have to do that. So somebody says, why don't I like baseball, which is Americans' pastime? Or when I was in Canada, why don't, well, I don't know what their pastime is. I think it's hockey, 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 hockey. or curling. I don't even know what curling is, but okay, that's a bowling. It's uh, bowling on ice with brooms. There you go. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So again, if I don't follow those things. Nobody's going to look twice to me, right? They're not going to think. But at the same time, if I didn't put a key on my head, which is not from the Torah, it's the rabbis already, or I don't put much film, which is the Torah, or I don't do a lot of things which are from the Torah or the rabbis, so it's, it's gonna, uh, then it's already, why aren't you doing this? I have no excuse why I'm not doing it, except I choose not to. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to do it. So then, I'm, then the whole thing I'm doing is always going to be put up to my to my uh, intelligence, that was, as it were. And I may not see the reason for it. And that's when the people stop circumcising their children. That's when people stop doing a lot of things. They, they start eating pork because they think, well, we know what trichinosis is. We know we're not going to get sick. Cook it to the proper temperature and we're all set. These are all health laws, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and we're saying, no, it's not that. So that's what I'm saying. When it comes to this, while the again the malachim can acknowledge god it's only our actions who can bring god into this world because we're doing it for that reason or can get god out of the world 
for that same reason, if I'm doing it for a different reason. These fundamental principles, and by the way, this is all going back to Shema. When I'm saying Shema Yishol Hashem, Lukem Hashem Echad, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. We're, we're making the Pledge of Allegiance to God at that point. These fundamental principles were already explained in their context. And he says, Ramchal explained how the actions of man affect the spiritual realm, which results in Shefa being brought downwards toward this physical world. But what is needed for a current topic is that if there will be justification for Hashem's uh, manifestation through his kingdom and he will rule over his world, which means that uh, what uh, Ramchal will explain in the next paragraph what causes Hashem to exert the, his sovereignty in this world, this will be re the result of the, in the abundance of the good and great tranquility being imparted to the created beings. And again, the Ramchal said above, uh, he explains this above, but he will now labor it on the ramifications of Hashem's sovereignty being acknowledged. Furthermore, there will be in, uh, an increase in Hashem's illumin illumination of sanctity, purity, and everything good. We learned in the previous chapter, he explains that through proper fear and love of Hashem, a person increases his levels of purity, sanctity, and divine illumination. From Chal states here that by Hashem's sovereignty being acknowledged, we increase these levels in the entire creation, which results in the enhancement of everything good. The forces of evil will be humbled and subjugated and not be able to impair the good of this world. And he explains that Ramchal stated above that when Hashem's oneness is revealed, evil becomes totally defeated and removed from the world. He writes here that even before that ultimate stage, when Hashem's sovereignty is acknowledged, evil will at least be sufficiently subdued so as not to cause any damage to the creation. Now, I don't know when that's going to be, but it's because uh, right now, if you look at the world today, it seems that Hashem is more hidden than ever before. Uh, just think about what's going on in today's society, with all the uh, the with all the murders going on, with people arguing about the craziest things that we've ever argued about. In all. I mean, to have a debate, a national debate about bathrooms, is the ultimate craziness. But anger, more. right? But the anger, uh, and it's just. Uh, you never, would, you never would have thought that we would have been arguing about that. You never would have thought that. You would have thought, okay, you know what? We have a single bathroom. Go into, make it a unisex bathroom. Leave me alone. You never thought you would have to have an argument and a president signing an executive order. You never. Growing up, I never would have thought we would need something like that. Again, again, but the point is, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into the argument. I was saying, you never would have thought that we would have a national debate about it. You never thought that the creatures would come out of the sewers. Okay, fine. I'm not, we always have perverts, by the way. There was always perverts in the world. There were always perverts. He's fired up to stay in the shadows. There were always perverts. So uh, there's nothing new. Uh, nothing's new under the sun. Absolutely nothing's new. Like I said, you never thought you'd have a national debate about it. That's all. And that's what I'm saying. Today, it seems, today, if you just say God in, in public, then you're, uh, you're, uh, you can be shut down. That's why you have to be, that's why if I was just against the government, you could lose your 5013C, all, all these uh, things, we could lose tax. So they're already shutting you up. And then they're trying to force things. And it's just amazing the attack that has been laid down on uh, against God or, and religion in general, but again, you would have thought, looking at the Constitution, that we would never have done this in this country. You would have thought, again, it, we're doing it. But that's what I'm saying. Today, it seems that we're we're getting darker and darker and darker uh, against the Rosh Hashanah is saying, and it could be because we're just not we just aren't acknowledging. We say we believe, but we're not living. We're not living that. That's my personal take on that. Seems upside down. Right. Everything. Right. So I'm saying, I think that we're not living it. And I think that goes on us. Not, not anything, and not on them. I think it goes on us. That we're not proud of what we do. 
and that we aren't happy with what we do. We do it because we have to, whatever the case is going to be. And, and more than that, we try to hide from them, them being the non-religious. We try to hide or we try to make excuses up. I don't think it's worthwhile. I think just as they're proud, quote unquote, proud of what they do, I think we should be proud of what we do. And not try to change them. I'm not interested. Don't change anybody. Let them do it. Like I said this morning. Like I said this morning, I think that everybody has their right to be wrong. I said this on tape too. Everybody has their right to be wrong. And they can say the same thing about me. I hold I'm right, they hold their right. So let's live our, our lives out. And whoever in the end wins, wins. If I'm wrong, so fine, I'm wrong. And I, and I die, I go to the ground, the, the worms eat me, it's done. And because there's no afterlife. If I'm right, there is an afterlife and I'm building up my spiritual real estate, Okay, so those who didn't do it, so they're going to be in trouble. That's all. It's as simple as that. So let's all live in peace. Let's have a respect, mutual respect for each other. I'm not going to change you. Don't change me. We'll have a, we'll just get along. That's all. That, that nobody's willing to do. On, on both sides, by the way. On both sides of the, to use our, again, political discussion, both, both parts of the aisle. Nobody's willing to leave the other guy alone. They all want to convince the other that, I'm right and you're wrong. It's a debate. We have to we have to make that statement. And I'm saying, fine. You do what you want, and I'll do what I want. And hopefully, if I'm if I'm by the way, if I'm happy with what I'm doing, the odds are you're going to want to have some of what I'm having. <laughs> you want it? What, what, who was who was the drink the Kool Aid? Uh, Jim Jones. Yeah. Okay. You're going to want to drink the Kool Aid because everybody wants to ultimately be happy. That's why they make the money they do. That's why they do what they do, because they want to be happy. That's all. So if you want to be happy, you see me being happy, the odds are that if I'm not pushing you, I just put it out there, you'll, you'll, you'll want to join me. You can disagree, but I think I'm right. But again, I, I can be right, you can be right. That, I, I, That's why people who are religious are afraid to speak out because the other side has the courts, the police, everything on their side to persecute you. Okay. I can't. People, I, quid pro quo, right. that would be a different thing. Well, that's just, I, I, that's why I said I would like that. I'm not saying, and that's my point. We're living in a very dark time. And that's all I'm saying. We're not disagreeing at this point. Okay. Give us a little more. We'll disagree, but not right now. Right now, we're agreeing. Okay. So he says, uh, but if not, then, uh, okay, right. But if not, then Hashem conceals his countenance and does not reveal the strength of his sovereignty. And he said that the Ramchal uh, stated above that the source of all evil is a concealment of Hashem's oneness. He now describes what the consequences are when Hashem's sovereignty is concealed as a result of people's actions. By the way, this is also important. When we start splitting God into pieces, nethers, devil, shadim, demons, and all these other things, when we start seeing separate powers, then we have the same problem. In other words, we have to recognize that Hashem is responsible, could have stopped, if so desired, the Holocaust. We have to put it where it belongs. Put the blame where it belongs. We also have to accept that the fact that I'm breathing, walking, and talking is from Hashem. Hashem is fantastic. But I also have to recognize that Hashem punishes. I have to recognize both sides. I can't say, oh, so, uh, the devil, God was asleep that day or for those years, or that the devil did it, or again, different spiritual emanations are going on. No, no. Once I do that, then I've lost two. And again, that's part of the problem. When I start having this breakdown of power, separation of powers, God is God. God has the power to do whatever God wants. God creates us. God can destroy us. God creates. God created the Satan. God created the Shaitan. God created, as we said, the the potential of evil. God created all of this. It's up to us to choose, and that's part of the free choice. That's part of the chiyuchavshim. But we have to choose properly. And when we don't, so the other side wins. 
and it weakens down. And that's again, because I'm, I'm allowing myself to believe that there's two or three or 20 or a thousand powers out there. And if I just get the right power, I can beat the other power. Thus you get into Greek mythology and so on and so forth. At such a time, the forces of evil break loose and rule with all the consequences of this matter uh, ma uh, manifesting itself where the, wherever they pertain, which is a collective of all the evil that exists in the world. So he says, thus, when Hashem's sovereignty is not recognized, evil can spread to all areas of the world. But since creation is divided into many components, components and systems, the way evil manifests, manifests itself in each area will depend upon what is pertinent there. For example, evil will manifest itself through sickness and natural catastrophe in this physical world, while it will manifest itself differently in the spiritual realms. In Ma'amar Hagu'ula, the Ramchal, the Ramchal writes that the manifestation of evil in the physical world is that, is, uh, that fruit has lost its taste. And that you have if you get in the wrong season around here. Okay. And uh, so let's continue. Uh, okay, and then it says 109. No, I think it's right. So now the Ramchal concludes with the impact of acknowledging Hashem's sovereignty through reciting the Shema. When Israel reinforced themselves in this matter daily, accepting Hashem's sovereignty and acknowledging it in their hearts and with their mouths, then Hashem is manifest through His sovereignty in this world. And he says, as the Ramchal explained in the previous paragraph, the manifestation of Hashem's Sovereignty depends upon man's actions. Thus, through our acceptance of Kriyat Shema <clears throat> and of Hashem's reign, that sovereignty becomes more greatly manifest in this world. Uh, thus, the forces of evil become dominated by the forces of good, and the blessing is drawn to the world. So really, it's not hard to bring the blessing as long as I acknowledge Hashem is one, that everything's coming from Hashem, and all of the measures that we have. It sounds simple. Like I said, it sounds simple. It seems to be simple, but apparently it's very difficult because most of us do, do make that distinction. And that's part of our human uh, capability where we see God, by the way, we don't see God as, we see God as something separate from us, something we can hide from. That was, that was Cain's problem going way, way back to creation. That was Kain's problem when, he, when Hashem said, where is your brother Hevel? Where is, a, where is Abel? And Hashem, so Kain thinks, ah. So he strokes his beard. <laughs> I don't know how old he was. He said, ah. So God doesn't know everything. Certain things keep me hidden from God. So what's going on there? Kain right away made the mistake of a human that God is limited. And once God is limited, then God is not God. You understand what I'm saying? So we all have that. We all see, people see God as a long, as an old man with a beard, whatever the expressions are going to be, and it's something that we that we have to train ourselves out of. Again, very difficult to do, because we all talk. We say He. We decide God is a man. It's not God's not neither a woman nor a female, uh, nor a woman nor a female, God, nor a male nor a female. Has another one? God is uh, beyond that. So we have to keep remembering that and keep enforcing it in our mind. And again, Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. Okay, that's what he's saying. So it's, it sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, now the Michal now explains the impact of testifying about Hashem's oneness. When bearing witness to Hashem's oneness, as we have mentioned above, he reciprocates and exalts himself in his oneness. At the end of his description of Hashem's oneness in Shekshon 1, the Ramchal stated, only that we bear witness to Hashem's oneness through our recital of Shema. The Ramchal adds here that our daily testimony of Hashem's oneness leads us to an increased, uh, to an increase in, in his revelation through, yeah, throughout the world. He thereby strengthens and adds to the world one rectification upon another within the context of the true rectification that we have discussed. Unlike the acknowledgement of Hashem's sovereignty, the revelation of God's oneness completely eradicates any vestige of evil. 
<coughs> which brings goodness upon creation, as Ramchal explained above. Thus, through our testimony of Hashem's oneness, we bring the world closer to His final goal of perfection. Uh, so that, then it says, towards which we all, towards which all the orchestrations of, of divine guidance are evolving, as Ramchal will state clearly below. All events in the world are inexorably headed toward the final rectification, by, but by bearing witness to Hashem's oneness, we can hasten the final perfected state of the world. Uh, consequently, Hashem also fulfills His plan, which is to be established, which is to establish a creation <coughs> within a state of complete goodness, as we have mentioned. Now, this is something we also have to keep in mind that the uh, the, the expression is always darkest before the dawn. Okay, because as you said, it's worse now than ever did before. Now, the truth is, I'm sure that rabbis throughout every century say that it looks worse now than it was before. But it's uh, what, what's going on here is when we all teach and talk about Hashem, and let's face it, God is on, however they want to look at it, however. Uh, corrupted the view is most people know of a God most people know of a higher power most people recognize the higher power however they're going to name it and, and now, and, but the problem is again they divide up that, that higher power okay? the, but uh, most people recognizing the God and so through discussions and, they're trying to, and people are trying to understand and so on and so forth that may be the saving grace <laughs> to use such language but that may be what's going on here too. That if I bring, if I keep saying Shema and and people with me saying Shema, and we're understanding what we're saying, and we teach it to our kids, and we te and they teach it to theirs, and so on and so forth. And then when we're talking, it says Bishif to Chavadecha, we've left to Chavadecha. We're walking on the way. We have to talk Torah too. Again, so you're with people, and they and you're talking Torah against amongst yourself, and they may overhear it, may not. I know when I go to Notre Dame, I don't exactly whisper when I'm in the uh, the fortune I'm, I'm using a normal voice so I'm sure that some people have overheard what I've said and maybe interested and maybe didn't I, it doesn't really matter to me what goes on but the bottom line is they heard two Jews and they recognize this as Jews certainly me because I would really keep on uh, talking God and it makes an impact you think it won't make an impact but that makes an impact that we're talking uh, using real issues like Uber and Halacha, and people are hearing that, wow, Jewish law speaks about Uber and says it is a permitted, not permitted. What? Who would think such a thing? Religion doesn't do that. Religion is be nice to your fellow man, don't, uh, don't blaspheme. It doesn't, mean I, it doesn't mean I have to deal with it in real life. And we're saying, oh, yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. I can't speak a certain way. I, I, I have a, I have unfair competition rules. I have a whole bunch of rules I have to worry about. So, you know, and people hear that. When they come to the Lunch and Learns, they hear that. Again, who would have thought that the Jewish law would have something to say about gun control, one way or the other? Who would have thought that? We understand you should not be marital sex. Okay, that, that's, that's religion. That's morals. But gun control? Immigration control. These are issues that we're discussing in, our, in modern day politics. And this is all talked about in the Talmud. And again, we've had lunch and learn some. They're not online, you have to come to those. But they're, uh, for the most part, they're not online. But you, you all remember because you come to most of them. We've talked about the craziest issues in history organ transplants. Uh, we've talked about uh, what, what the other stuff that uh, uh, DNA research. What? Yes, yeah, can you play sports? Sports and halacha, good. We had one about stealing internet from somebody walking good. down the sidewalk. Email, right, can you do My that? My computer didn't work about a month ago, so we called the, the man out. And it's because I lived right across from the hospital. People in the hospital parking lot were taking all of my internet. <laughs> They're stealing, ripping off. Okay. They didn't hear the class. They didn't care about the class either. But again, when you think about that Jewish law, and I've always said this when I when it comes to these issues, when we look at these issues, to imagine that texts that are over one that are nearly two thousand years old, 
still are relevant today. Anticipate everything. Right. That's just something that's, and again, people hear that, and they say, wow, there's something here. There's something to this religion. There's something to this God. And they're not all going to become Jewish. I'm not looking for them to become Jewish. But they'll recognize that this is a God. And, and, what, and we certainly, when I've been on the radio, not here in, in Maine, and they brought up the devil, and I said, we don't believe in that. And by the way, I have to say, Baruch Hashem, all my colleagues, conservative reform and, uh, and me, we spoke different times. But each time the devil came up, we all said the same thing. Wrong religion. We don't believe in that. It was a united front. And we never talked about it to be a united front either. But we all knew that it's not a Jewish belief. And we explained what the Satan was every single time. And the people kept hearing that. We don't believe in what you believe. No matter what they want to believe. Okay? And again, that's, that puts it out there. So people think, well, wait. If you don't believe it, and we're coming from you, so why do we believe it? Okay, that's your headache, not mine. You know, but it's, uh, that's what I'm saying. When we talk about Hashem, we make Hashem real to people. That's what we're trying to do here. And that's when goodness comes out, because once I recognize, and I've said this many times, once I know, understand, recognize that there is a God watching every move I make, big brother watching, then I'm going to be careful with what I do going to be careful with what I say. Not because I'm afraid of punishment. That's foolishness. Because I respect Hashem. And when I respect Hashem and I love Hashem, because I know Hashem loves me regardless of what I'm going through. Because if Hashem is doing something to me, then I have to recognize, again, that's from love. That's a heart, again, very difficult to, to imagine that we're going to get to that level. Chas Hashem, something's happening to you. What, the first thing you know, the first thing you're thinking of is, oh, thank you so much, Hashem, for the gift. <laughs> you can take it away, please. Just take this mock away. But you also should recognize that it's a cleansing. Or it's getting me to the next level, whatever the case is, whether I deserve it or not. You know, maybe God's getting me to the next level. Again, it's all something that we have to recognize is from God and not because I shook your hand and caught the virus. How many people, how many mothers can kiss their children? who have whatever they have, and never catch that virus. Never. They are immune. And somebody, somebody sneezes, and I catch them. <laughs> What's going on here? Okay, hey, you go to school, all these things. Imagine this. Somebody can go to school, and which is, is uh, germ warfare. It's the ultimate biological warfare. Schools in general are biological warfare. And what happens is, one person goes in with a stomach virus. Half the class goes down, half the class stays up. Or even more, the kids go down. One kid never gets sick. Why? What happened? The kids at Sodic, that's what happened. <laughs> God is looking at this guy. Yeah, that is torturing him because he's the one in school. However, he wants to look at that. I don't know. But imagine that when these kids survive and they don't get sick. And they're looking, well, how do you get sick? Well, you know, it's crazy. But again, that's part of it. We have to recognize that all that's all from Hashem. And if you do, you're bringing God into the world. And then the goodness comes in. And then you're going to follow because, again, you're respecting, not because you're afraid of. Those who do it because they're afraid, I can guarantee them one thing, that God's not going to send down a lightning bolt right now. Maybe in 30 years, something will happen. But when you break Shabbos, I have empirical proof. <laughs> you're not going to die. Empirical we have 90% of the Jews break Shabbos. Every single Shabbos. And nobody's dying. They're not going poor. Nothing's happening. They're, die they're dying spiritually. Spiritually they're dying. I'm not going to argue. But they're not, you know, the zot, God's coming down to kill you. And if God, by the way, if God did do that, there would be no free will. And if God rewarded me for everything that I did, and I was a rich man, if I were a rich man, blah, 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 and I would have the, the, the castles and everything else, and I'd drive my Cadillac like Coupe de Ville's, and I'd have, I'd be like, what's his name? Uh, the guy was 31 cars. Uh, he used to be in The Tonight Show. Jay Leno. Jay Leno. Jay Leno, 31 cars lined up so I can do what I want. Who cares? If that's success, and, so, and let's say that was success, then everybody would look to what I'm doing, and they would do it. So it would be no free will again. God has to make it clear that it doesn't seem fair in this world. And that's your free will. 
That's why the tzaddikim nevech, sometimes they, they lose their mind or they get sick or whatever. They're not the richest people in the world. Although if you ask them, they may very well tell you, I don't need anything. I don't know. They may, in their minds, they may be rich. Because why do we, how do you say, say in Kavot, Ezu Asher, who's a rich person, Hamasameh Bechatko, wants happiness portion. If you're happy with what you have, you're a rich man. If you're not happy with what you have, you'll be miserable. By the way, you can have $10 billion, and this is proven by all your stars and all the other people who make money, uh, mega bucks. They're not happy. They're just not happy. They're, they're still looking for something. And you're thinking, I don't get you. You're at the height of success. What else do you want? They don't know. That's why Madonna went to, to uh, Zohar or Kabbalah, because she thought she would get something. Whether or not she did, I have no idea. But she was looking for something. And all her friends were looking for something. Again, you're at the height of your game. There was no reason for it. You had everything you could have ever wanted. You thought you'd be happy. And what you found out was you, you weren't. And so why? What are you missing? You're missing a relationship with God. Not based upon fear, but based upon love and respect. And following the laws because, like I said from the beginning, Hashem said so. Not because I agree with Him. I don't have to agree. As a matter of fact, it's better if I don't agree sometimes. Because then I know I'm doing it for the right reason. Okay. The first chapter in the introduction about rationalizing mm -hmm. that you're trying to find if you, you're in the wrong direction if you're trying to find a reason for everything. Right. 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 Rational. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you can't look for reasons, by the way. I'm not saying one cannot look for reasons. What I'm saying is that if I find a reason and you disprove that reason, it shouldn't affect my practice. And then it's why science every generation has a new truth mm -hmm. and it keeps getting disapproved right right that's all okay so now what you need to know what we what you need to understand about this is that this entire discussion regarding how our testimony to Hashem's oneness in Shema perfects the creation is only referring to the ratification of creation occurring through the initiative of man rather than unilaterally and explains there is also the possibility that man's actions will be lacking <coughs> and that the creation will be perfected through divine intervention we really don't want that to happen by the way we really rather avoid that because if it's going to be through unilateral intervention that means that you know game over it's just game over at that point for the divine guidance has already been arranged and has established along this path that all of its chains of all of its chain of events are moving toward the perfection of the world. He says, since the essence of Hashem's oneness is that He does not depend on anything else whatsoever, His oneness can be revealed even when the actions of mankind are deficient. Thus, the creation is being led inexorably to its completion. If you want another example of that, just think about this. You're driving on the highway, and there's what we call a speed trap. You don't see the officer, the police officer, until it's too late. Then he shoots the gun at you, that speed gun, pull over. That is divine. The, the example, the best example you can have of what we're talking about, divine intervention, where you thought you could get away with anything, and suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, when you wouldn't have thought it was going to happen, you get pulled over, and that's and then you're stuck. Right? That that would be an example of Hashem is going towards this perfection, and what, we can help it. We can do what we're supposed to do, and we may get there earlier because well, actually, once we perfect it, we got there earlier, or it's going to happen at a certain time. And that's when they say, by the way, that's why the Talmud says in the year six thousand, that Jewish time, which uh, God will, we'll all see. Who knows? But it's uh, it's a long way off at this point. But 6,000 would be the time that the Mashiach is going to... Deadline for Mashiach. That's the deadline. It can't, because that's already Ere Shabbos. So the Mashiach has to come by the year 6,000. Again, that would be what the Mechal is saying. Whether or not he's going to be here, we can argue it out later. <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it, we're in 57, 76 right now, in 200-odd uh, years, we'll have a discussion about this 
God willing, well, wouldn't, uh, God willing, he'll prove himself and come. But it's uh, by that time, certainly, if not before. But it's, uh, if he doesn't, we'll have excuses. Don't worry. <laughs> we weren't fit for it. That's what I'll say. Okay. But this, but I was just going with that, okay? So this is what Hashem orchestrates. This is what Hashem orchestrates through His goodness and His power. And He says, Hashem created the, the world <clears throat> to bestow goodness upon man. Thus, His desire to bestow goodness together with His omnipotence direct, uh, direct the world towards His final perfection, no matter what. So, uh, okay. And however, the divine wisdom decreed <coughs> that this should be accomplished by man. Although perfection, he explains, is inevitable, Hashem decreed that man should have the, the ability to accomplish this on his own. The Ramchal stated previously that the divine wisdom dictated that man should acquire Hashem's goodness. Thus, although through Hashem's goodness he leads creation to completion, as the Ramchal stated in the previous sentence, though uh, through Hashem's wisdom man has been given the ability to lead the world to that conclusion. At that point, mankind, having accomplished this, will have, stayed, will have reached its state of perfection. And the very perfection will uh, itself be the ultimate one. He says, since the ultimate desire of Hashem is that man acquire his state of perfection on his own, if this will occur, it will bring the ultimate completion of the world. Uh, so, since the created beings themselves will have acquired the perfection as we have mentioned. And he says, if Hashem perfected the world on his own, this perfection would not be the ultimate goodness that Hashem can bestow upon his creation. Uh, rather, the ultimate goodness is when man acts to perfect himself and becomes the master of the perfection of his perfection. And why? So the Ramchal already said that the only time we're going to appreciate what we have is when we work at it. And I think it's a true statement. But if we appreciate things much more then when we uh, when we do it, then one is given to us. When we fight a little bit for it, we appreciate it much more. Uh, yeah, so, consequently, the entire principle underlying this, the matters is that what Hashem has arranged and prepared for the perfection of His creation can be completed and implemented through mankind when it itself perfects its uh, when it perfects itself with that perfection. That is appropriate for it. So he said, so with, again, we're going back to, uh, when it says underlying this matter, we're going back to the mitzvah of saying Shema, because it's Hashem's inevitable plan for the world, even a man's actions are deficient. Thus, by bearing, through bearing witness to Hashem's oneness by properly reciting Shema, man can be the force that generates this perfection and thereby perfect himself. So when you're davening tonight and tomorrow morning and so on and so forth, you should have in mind when you think Shema, you could really be causing the unification, uh, a quote-unquote unification of the world, bringing perfection to the world, and thus bringing an end to the, uh, to the world as we know it. <laughs> without dropping bombs, without doing anything. Imagine if people would just take this seriously, and all they have to do is observe Hashem, and all the bad stops. I don't know, it seems like a simple thing. It seems very simple, but people don't want to do it. And I think it goes back to what the Ramchal was saying from the beginning, that people want to do it their way. I did it my way. I don't want to do your way. Your way is fraught with uh, rules. It says in this week's Parsha that the people complained to Moshe that we want, uh, we're tired of this man, we were in Egypt, we got fish for free and all, all the other vegetables that they mentioned. Rashi says, what do you mean for free? You, you had to run around getting a straw, and they made you do that. So how can you get fish for free? So far, as Sharash explains from the Midrash, it says, free for mitzvot. They didn't have to do any mitzvot. It came whether they got it or not. In other words, they did their work, they didn't do their work. They still got, the, they still got fed. It wasn't a matter of fulfilling a mitzvah in the proper time and so on and so forth. Yeah, they would be beaten. I'm not going to argue about being beaten. But they, but they enjoyed, it was easier not to have to follow rules of God. And, and by the way, what were the rules? Think about this. You're in the desert. You have clouds surrounding you. Your clothes are being ironed every day. You're, you're, you don't need new clothes because they're growing with you. 
bread is coming down from the heavens. You're getting uh, quails coming right here. You just grab and cook it up. Do what you want. Okay? The, the man tastes like whatever you want it to taste like. You're in an idyllic world. And you're complaining. You're still complaining. <laughs> you're still complaining. Now will go back to what, to what the Ramchal was saying. That if you, uh, the, uh, that when, if you really want something, you have to work at it. When, when God's giving everything to them, they're saying, I, I, no, no, you know, this is too hard. So I have to follow your rules. I don't want to follow your rules. And it's something we deal with today. Okay, so the, we'll have to stop here. The next class, again, will be, for those who are watching online, will be August 2nd or 3rd, whatever that date is, okay? We're taking a break.